Hello, uh, my name is Teresa. Uh, I'm, uh, I would like to uh, welcome you on our uh, Cloud Native Meetup. Uh, this one, it's the 16th. Uh, it, we are doing it almost for two years. It's amazing. Uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, for the first uh, thing uh, to the Revolgy. Uh, because we are organizing this meetup, uh, we are trying to support the cloud native community. And uh, also, I would like to thank to uh, our partner in crime, uh, um, Pipetail with Marek Bartik. Um, well, uh, let's have a look uh, who are the speakers for today. Uh, the first will be uh, Ondra Sheri. Uh, Andra Sheri is uh, from uh, Pure Storage and Portworks. Uh, and uh, second one will be uh, Eric Ferenc, and he's from Revolgy. Uh, so I would like to uh, ask you uh, to comment on the, in the comment section on the YouTube channel. Uh, ask anything uh, you'd like, uh, because uh, it's, it's best when we, get, when we have some feedback and we have some uh, like live uh, questions. And this is a time for you. Ondro and Eric uh, to take the mic and uh, let's have a talk. Thanks, Rika. Uh, so let me share my slides. So, uh, as mentioned, uh, I'll be talking about uh, portworks, uh, and in particular about persistent storage in Kubernetes, which is what we do. Um, portworks is now part of pure storage, so I'll just briefly try to mention something about the company. Uh, don't worry, there will be uh, plenty of technical stuff after that and, and a demo, but just bear with me. Uh, portworks is not that well known company in, in Prague, I would say. Uh, but it's relatively old already. It was founded in 2009, and it originally um, started creating uh, storage appliances that were pure flash. Uh, still at the time when, where flash was relatively expensive, and the bet was that it would get uh, cheaper eventually, which is which which it did. Uh, we are relatively successful, growing very rapidly. We made it into uh, stock exchange in late 2015. Uh, we produced uh, appliances called Flash Array and Flash Blade. Uh, very successful, I would say. 2018, uh, first billion plus in revenue. And in 2020, we actually started office in Prague. So early 2020, uh, first uh, Prague people or uh, Prague employees uh, were on board. And in late uh, 2000, 2020, we acquired Portworks. So uh, pure storage, originally from uh, sort of hardware storage, but it would be untrue to say that we are a storage company. We are software or hardware company. We are mostly software company, actually, because there is a lot going on in cloud. Uh, all our or most of our appliances would send uh, analytics, logs, uh, to our cloud and we'll be processing that to make sure that everything is uh, running as it should, uh, even preemptively solving issues for the customers. So there's a lot of software development involved. I would say that the hardware part is maybe even, even uh, smaller than the software now, even though I, I don't know the numbers. One thing that we are especially proud for is uh, the net promoter score of 83.5, which is really good, uh, meaning whether our customers would recommend us to other customers. And this, this is in top 1% uh, between B2B companies. Uh, Portworks itself, on the other hand, uh, started from uh, as a software layer uh, over, over storage. Uh, so it, it comes from different direction. Uh, it's a software storage uh, overlay uh, that uh, works for uh, containers in general, but uh, uh, for Kubernetes in, in particular. Uh, we have many customers, uh, many more than, than visible here. Uh, we partner with the most uh, sort of infrastructure providers, uh, most important, I would say. 
Um, one example for all, uh, if you have kids, you probably know Roblox, the company that, that's uh, creating a gaming platform. It has uh, 70 million active monthly gamers worldwide, and it's been growing very, very fast, uh, but originally started uh, with like Windows-based uh, software, which was relatively expensive to, to scale. So they were looking at something that would help them scale for uh, thousand nodes, uh, something that would use containers, and they for sure needed some storage. So they looked around and um, they came up with, uh, in the end, combination of HashiCorp Nomad, which is uh, container uh, and VM uh, sort of orchestrator that allows them to scale to these numbers of nodes so they can run both VMs and containers in it. And they use Portworks uh, Enterprise uh, for, for storage management, which allows them to do all the things they need, like encryption, uh, replication, so that they don't ever lose uh, user data. Uh, so that's one of the, uh, one of the customers. Uh, but let's get to the technical part, let's say. Uh, I assume everyone on the call knows Kubernetes. Uh, maybe not everyone knows how it uh, handles storage. So I'll try to say the basics. Uh, Kubernetes has first-class support uh, for, for storage in the sense that it has resources uh, called persistence volume claim and persistent uh, volume and storage class. Persistent volume claim is a resource that uh, expresses a request for, for storage. Uh, and if you create a resource, then Kubernetes or some other implementation tries to provide persistent volume, which is the actual, actual volume, actual, actual block of storage that you can then mount into your container. And then there is a storage class that uh, is an entity that expresses shared properties of, of different different volumes. So each uh, persistent volume would have a storage class that would define its properties and also where the storage should came from. For this, uh, Kubernetes uses uh, CSI, which is Container Storage Interface. It is more generic than just Kubernetes, so Nomad would, Nomad would uh, use the same things. Um, and it's an interface that, that uh, describes how containers should uh, access storage and how that storage could be provided on the other hand. Uh, most cloud providers would have their own implementation that, which would be used by Kubernetes. So AWS, GCP, Azure, DigitalOcean, all those would have their own CSI implementation, but also uh, like hardware storage providers. For example, Pure Storage has a Pure Storage Orchestrator, which does, does this job and, and provides a CSI or implements a CSI interface. And also Portworks uh, implements the CSI interface so that it can provide storage uh, uh, to, to Kubernetes and other uh, container orchestrators. Um, in general, Kubernetes uh, is known to be great for running stateless applications, like no doubt about that. If you have an application that doesn't require persistent uh, storage, it, it's great. It can uh, it can uh, live there, it can scale there. Uh, if you have a new version, uh, Kubernetes does rolling update for you. Um, all those things uh, is it, great at uh, load balancing and stuff. But if you have stateful application that actually needs storage uh, that's persistent and available and efficiently accessible, it's a bit harder. Uh, if you run in a managed Kubernetes, like in AWS, GCP, uh, you, you would already have these things provided via the CSI uh, interface for you. Uh, but they would very often be quite specific to, to that platform. If you want to have uh, like bare metal Kubernetes, you're out of luck. You have to do this somehow yourself, manage that yourself. And that's uh, that's where Portworks come, comes in. Uh, it sort of creates this layer which can manage your uh, storage that's on the bare metal machines, but it can also abstract you from, from the storage provided by the cloud. And it can work nicely in a hybrid environment where you speak just one language, the Portworks language, let's say, um, and, and you don't care whether you're using uh, disks provided or storage provided by the cloud in, in the background or, or by storage that's already on your bare metal, bare metal machines. Uh, so that's where Portworks comes in. Uh, you can look at it as like Kubernetes providing the application lifecycle management uh, and uh, Portworks uh, providing the data lifecycle management. Uh, so it can uh, originally, it, it would just claim uh, the, the disks on your bare metal machines and provide them uh, to Kubernetes or other container orchestrator. But now it, it's more, it can, it can give you storage from uh, 
SAN and the cloud providers, as I said, but it does even more. It, it uh, provides uh, backup uh, disaster recovery and it has things like Stork, which uh, is actually a scheduler for Kubernetes, which um, uh, supports uh, scheduling decisions for your pods based on uh, where the data is actually located. So if you have the scenario where Portworx uh, manages uh, storage that's actually present or on bare metal machines, it, it can tell Kubernetes to, to schedule pods where the data is actually locally uh, available. It would work even if it's not locally available, but obviously it's more efficient if, 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 if it is. Uh, then there's Autopilot, which uh, allows you, it's like a rule-based engine, which allows you to react on certain situation, for example, to, to expand volumes uh, when, when needed. Uh, if you have an, uh, a database, for example, and it's running, uh, it, it's slowly running out of storage on your volume, it can, uh, based on a rule, uh, extend that storage. Uh, and then PX Backup, which allows backing up uh, your entirely, uh, entire application. So not, not just storage, but also the uh, Kubernetes resources from one cluster, possibly uh, creating on another, uh, and, and more, and more will come. Uh, if you take everything, you can have this situation where you have several clusters, one in the same area, and you can use Portworx to um, synchronously uh, replicate data to a cluster which is in the same area and have it uh, standing by. And if something happens, uh, you can just right away switch to the second cluster, the one in the middle, let's say. And, or uh, you can have a cluster that's uh, somewhere else and you can do asynchronous uh, snapshots incrementally and uh, with a bit uh, longer delay, you can have that uh, cluster up and running and serving your traffic as well. And that, that's all that uh, Portworx can, can, can do for you. Uh, and you, you don't sort of need to, need to care. You don't need to manage your, your scripts that, that would do this for you. Everyone can do that, but uh, you create probably more problems than with this um, uh, solution that, that, that's uh, fine-tuned for you. Uh, so that was just briefly, but um, the main point here is I wanted to show a demo of Portworx actually running. So let me show what, I, what I've got. Um, I have some files here, YAML files, obviously. Everyone loves YAML files if they are, they are into Kubernetes. And I have a Kubernetes cluster. Let me use this Knan tool. This basically shows stuff running in that Kubernetes cluster. And you can see there are some pods. I'm now displaying pods, and there are Portworx uh, API and KVDB. So, which basically means Portworx is installed on this cluster. Uh, I can also check the status of, of Portworx on this cluster, and particularly on one of the nodes. And it should tell me the, the status of uh, like the node that it actually took ownership of, of some uh, disks that were on this uh, on this Kubernetes node, and they were unused. And it will also tell, tell me a summary about the cluster as a whole and how much storage is uh, is where that I have a uh, capacity of three terabytes, which is basically on each node, I have three uh, one terabyte disks and it takes them all. Uh, so in total, I have nine terabytes of, uh, of capacity. Uh, so that's what I have. I'll just hide this thing. Right, so th that's what we have, and let's see what files we have. So what I'll be doing, I'll be setting up MySQL with replicated volume uh, on, on uh, Portworx, provided by Portworx. So first of all, I need to create a namespace. So that's this very simple YAML. So let's just uh, apply it, because we'll need a namespace for the demo. Now, I, I have the namespace. What I need next is a password. So for MySQL, I'll create a secret uh, which contains uh, my, my password for the MySQL app. It's not a great password, but let, let's just ignore it for now. Obviously, we would have created something stronger if this was production. I created the, the secret. What's there? Uh, we, have, we, we need the storage, the persistent storage for the MySQL. So let's see. Uh, uh, this is the storage class. So I said storage class sort of uh, contains the shared uh, properties of, of volumes that, that use that class. In this case, it tells me that I want the vo volumes provided by Portworx and that they should be replicated. So there should be three replicas 
and also that uh, I want to use DB profile with high uh, priority, IO priority. So let me just create it. And any volume uh, claim using this uh, storage class would have the shared, shared properties. So that means that I will probably have a volume here, persistent volume claim, uh, which is the one which we will use for the MySQL. And I will request one, uh, one gig. Uh, and I want that read write once, that makes sense for database. And I want to use the storage cloud that I just uh, created a few moments ago. So let me apply this one as well. So now we can switch uh, to that QT's uh, console, let's say. And we see that the volume has been already created uh, in, its, uh, in the bound state. And in the events, we see that it has been, uh, has been provided. So we had the volume to, to place the MySQL data on. Uh, we can also have a look at the uh, this from the point of portworks so i can ask actually portworks directly sort of outside of kubernetes uh, what it knows about uh, the volumes currently and i should see two volumes here one i created for the, the rest of the demo let's say uh, so we'll ignore it it's the first one and then uh, this one has been created uh, as a reaction to the persistent volume claim now i, I should have last demo here which is the mysql itself and this one is a bit uh, longer, but more or less, it's just a deployment, Kubernetes deployment, which contains uh, the MySQL of some version, uh, uses Stork as scheduler to make sure it's running uh, somewhere where the volume, where one of the volume rep replicas uh, is available. It uses uh, the password I created, and this more or less all important, uh, the volume, of course, and it mounts it where MySQL is storing the data. So, so here. Let me not get uh, into too much details, but it's really just a standard deployment using uh, Stork as a scheduler and MySQL image. So let me apply that. That should have created a MySQL deployment. Uh, it's here and will be creating uh, pods. So it's now creating a container for MySQL. You can even have a look at what's in it. Uh, so it started to pull the image, successfully pulled the image, created a container. So it should be running. It's running now, All right. Um, what we need next is uh, we need some data. Uh, for that, we have this script that we need to run on the MySQL. And to do that, I'll just connect to that MySQL container and run uh, MySQL client on it. And uh, it's the fill, fill the data using this script. So uh, to do that, I'll exec bash in that container. So yeah, that's this MySQL one. You've seen it uh, just now. And I'll run bash there. So right now I'm running shell in, in the container of MySQL. And I've filled some, some data in. You can even uh, connect to MySQL itself. Uh, and we, we see a new database here. Uh, it was empty originally, started the PX demo. So, and we just now created this one with some data. So let's see at least how many lines we have. So we have uh, 1000 new items that we just created. So, so far so good. Uh, and I said, um, we, we have a deployment, but it's running single single pod. So we could be curious what happens if, if that pod dies, right? Uh, what we can do, we can simulate a, a node outage. So let's see where it's running. It's running on this node, node zero. So we can cordon that node. 
tell Kubernetes not to schedule stuff on it anymore. And we can simply go here and kill the pod. Kubernetes would right away start a new one on a different node. It's creating already, uh, probably uh, pulling the image, right? Otherwise, that, that's the only thing that should take some time because the volume would be already there since it's replicated. Um, so it's running now. You can just quickly double check that it's actually, uh, it's a new pod, so it will be a different, uh, different ID of the pod, name of the pod. Let's connect to it again. And we should see that our data there. So there should be uh, PXDB. Okay. And we have the data there. So uh, this is not something striking, like that would happen with probably any resistant volume. Well, what is there and wasn't entirely visible is that since we have three replicas, the replica was immediately available on the other node and it was available locally. So we have efficient MySQL that, that started, uh, I would say immediately, but it actually took time to pull the image because it wasn't there initially. But actual volume uh, was right there. So uh, if, we, if we use something cloud-based, we would typically uh, pay the price of the, the volume being remote all the time while we work with my, this, that database. So all the time for all queries, we would, we would pay the price of having remote volume. But it would be also be available this way. If you kill the pod, it would still be available for, for another pod on, on another node. Uh, this way, however, with portworks, we have it locally. Already, it's there, it's sitting there. So all accesses are actually local, so super efficient. Right, um, let me step into, into another part of this demo. So I said we can do backups and restores. So what we can do, uh, we can actually snapshot the volume. So we can store it, store a copy locally, let's say. Uh, that's, so we'll have another set of uh, files. And this one uh, tells Kubernetes to actually create a snapshot, which in turn tells uh, Portworks to do that and Portworks will, will comply. So, Basically, apply this snapshot, uh, this YAML. And we should you should see that uh, we actually got some snapshot data which represents uh, the actual payload of the snapshot. So, so it's there, something happened. And if, if that snapshot, we can create a copy of that PVC. So of that, uh, actually, of that uh, resistant volume. So we have another YAML, which uh, describes another persistent volume claim. So request for storage. Uh, this, this time we request two gigabytes so that the snapshot fits there. It's, we could have used one, I guess. Um, uh, and we tell it uh, from which snapshot uh, we want to create sort of seed the data of this uh, volume. So Kubernetes uh, or, or uh, Portvox via CSI uh, would see that we should uh, seed this new volume with this data. So we'll go there and, and make sure that initially uh, or the initial ver values or data in, in this storage in this volume would be the ones from, from the snapshot. So let's let's just do that. And after applying this, you should have a new PVC created. So that's the volume claim. We have it there. That's the snap clone. That was its name. And we should also have to see the corresponding persistent volume. So this is a request for, for the volume. And this is the actual volume. So both are there. This, store, uh, th this one is, is the new one. We can see it because there's a uh, slightly bigger capacity uh, and a slightly different uh, storage class. Uh, so we, we have the volume and to fully uh, restore the database, we also need uh, 
a deployment that would use this persistent volume. So this is basically more or less copy of what we had. It's again a deployment, only it uses uh, a different volume. It uses this clone. So if I apply this one, you would basically have the same two databases running aside, each using their own volume, and one would be uh, sort of a replica or of the, of the original one. So let's see the pods. We have now running this new one. It's running just uh, 15 seconds, uh, MySQL snap. And just to make sure that it's really the one that we wanted or it contains the data that we want, we can uh, connect to it again and do the same uh, little trick with uh, counting the rows. So the data is there, uh, and it is using different different volumes. So that the copy has been made, uh, which is which is good. Now uh, I, I've showed that uh, if I kill the pod, it can start a new on another node, having the data right there available efficiently. I've shown that I can do a snapshot and, and recreate the instance, but that's usually not what we want to do, right? Because that means you need to have another set of YAMLs or somehow uh, edit your production one, which is not great. But what you really want is actually for this to happen somehow automatically, and Portox can do that as well. Uh, so there's another set of YAML files, um, and this time we'll, we'll be doing the actual backup of uh, stuff uh, into an external location and restoring the whole application. So let's see what we've got there. Uh, we have a backup location that uh, has some data about uh, S3. So basically it connects to S3 with some access key uh, and access key ID. Um, don't start connecting with those credentials. This is actually a, a local running S S3 or uh, implementation of the S3 protocol, so we wouldn't connect to Amazon with this. Um, and we will use that to actually store the copy uh, of, uh, of the entire application. Let me just create this location so that uh, Protox knows about it, where to store the data. And what else? Uh, now we have backup, which tells uh, Portworks or Stork rather, uh, that you want to backup an application uh, to the backup location I just created. Uh, and I want to backup stuff in namespaces demo, that's ours, that's fine. And everything that's uh, labeled with, uh, with a label up MySQL, which happens to be our MySQL and it's uh, resistant volume claim. So let me create that one as well. And what we should observe is that uh, there's new object application backup and it's being uh, created. So it's right now it's in progress. It's here. Uh, the PVC has been backed up successfully already. There's the total size and it's now in final stage and it's been successful. So I now have a successful backup of the entire application which consists of uh, the persistent volume and the deployment and the persistent volume claim. Uh, I didn't label the, 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 the secret, so it, it's not part of this now. Uh, what I do now is uh, I just go here and I kill the MySQL. I can kill the snapshot as well when I'm at it. And I'll delete all the PVCs. And once these are really gone, I'll try to restore stuff. Which is a bit more real life scenario, right? Something really, I don't know, uh, you accidentally deleted everything or you need to restore stuff in a new cluster. Uh, it's taking a bit longer than I would hope for. Did I delete it actually? 
Oh, I need to delete the deployment, sorry. Um, so let me delete the deployments, because otherwise it would uh, start a new port, obviously. So now it's terminating the pods as well, and we should uh, get rid of the PVCs momentarily. All right, so the first one is gone, the second one will be gone very soon. I don't need to wait for the snapshot, I guess. It's not too relevant. Uh, the last one, uh, and I promise this is the last part, um, is the actual restore. So I create a new object application restore, uh, and I tell it the name of the backup and the backup location. And if there's any leftovers, what to do with those? So uh, this way I tell uh, Portworks or Stork, Stork as its component uh, to actually restore stuff that's in that particular backup in that particular location. Let me start that or apply that. Uh, so we should see that soon enough, uh, you'll get this persistent volume claim recreated and the port recreated. I guess I can try to wait for it. Okay, so something got here. It's still in the low status, but should be uh, should be populated very soon. It's bound now, so uh, we should see also the pod, and it's the MySQL. It's now being created on node two, and it's now running. So as the very last step to persuade you, this is actually holding the data it should. I connect to this new pod, so it's slightly differently named again. And do the very same thing again. So I guess I should have deleted some of the ta ta mm, tables. Uh, I guess you can imagine how that would look. So we still have the data there, even though we manually deleted all the PVCs. With that, I guess that's enough for the demo. Uh, I just wanted to very briefly say the takeaway is Kubernetes is great for stateless apps. Everyone knows that, but stateless, stateless is uh, quite often hard. People often deploy the databases outside Kubernetes, which means they have to manage two different approaches to managing stuff, or they just use cloud uh, databases provided by their uh, cloud provider, which however locks them in very, very deeply and that can cost them money um, in the long run. Uh, and Portbox is here to help. Uh, it prevents vendor lock, lock in. Uh, it does uh, manage storage for you in bare metal scenarios or um, uh, in, in uh, hybrid clouds. And in addition, it helps with backups, replication, and encryption. I haven't shown that one, but you can have your volumes encrypted, which is really, really important as well. Uh, if you want to know more, uh, you can always uh, reach out to me. Uh, this is my email address. Uh, we are always hiring. Uh, we are always looking for uh, more customers that, that want to uh, manage uh, storage in a reasonable way. And, and we are here to help with that as well. So are there any questions? And I'm not sure how to handle those. Uh, Terka, maybe you can read them if there's uh, yes. something. Yes. Uh, Ondra, thank you for the great talk and for, for the demo. I hope uh, uh, it was visible on the stream. So we have a lot of questions. Well. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of questions, so I will show them. Uh, cloud providers worry inability to deal with scalability issues. What common frustrations did the speakers have with scalability that was unfortunately common amongst old cloud providers? Scale that I'm, I'm not sure what exactly it uh, refers to. Uh, uh, I guess the, the biggest advantage of, of having, let's say, uh, storage managed the way I described, apart from all the things that you get uh, in extra, like the backup and restore, is that you actually have things both uh, uh, like replicated, so they're, they're safe there. You can have number of replicas, but they're also locally available if you use the storage already available on the machines. 
So uh, that, that's one thing that helps with uh, scaling in the sense of uh, effectivity of, of the applications running on top of that. Uh, with cloud providers, actually, I, I think they are scaling pretty pretty well. So I'm not sure uh, what was the shortcoming that, that it's uh, being hinted at. Okay, if, if it's not uh, like answered properly, uh, I encourage uh, Tanvir Salib to ask more uh, in the chat so we can we can talk about it later. Uh, the second one is, uh, you, Andra mentioned HashiCorp was used, to, uh, used by companies like Roblox to resolve scalability problems. If the speakers also use Hashi, HashiCorp, uh, what were the pros and cons of using it for scalability? So HashiCorp Nomad, uh, I don't use it personally, so I, I'm not sure. Uh, the, the case study I mentioned with Roblox, uh, the reason for using HashiCorp was mostly because at that time, uh, HashiCorp Nomad would, would uh, allow working with both VMs and, and containers which I think Kubernetes is still not too great at, even though there are, there are uh, efforts to, to allow like uh, this cube word and, and stuff like that, that, that allows you running VMs as well. So I think that was the primary choice for a reason for the choice of Nomad. Another one, uh, how does database storage affect scalability performance? If it does or not. Database storage, um, I guess mostly efficiency, as, as I mentioned. Um, uh, obviously, you, you can have some databases that actually scale by design. I don't know, like CockroachDB and, and those things that are designed to run uh, sharded and, and uh, replicate it. But if you are if you are locked in uh, standard SQL databases uh, and you use it uh, in a heavily relational way so that you can't shard it easily, um, then you can run into into scalability issues like you, you don't have big enough machine to, to fit it on, right? So it's important that it's uh, efficiently using the storage and by that you can save a lot. Uh, Kubernetes is often used on cloud hosted sites. How does Kubernetes affect the load on a cloud hosted website? Okay, can you read it again? Sorry, I'm not sure I got that question. Kubernetes is often used on cloud-hosted sites. How does okay. Kubernetes affect the load on the cloud-hosted website? Um, not, not sure how to respond. Like, um, if, if you have a website that's mostly static, obviously, if, if Kubernetes, you can you can you can scale easily and load balance the, the traffic as you need. Um, if you have something that stores data, which would be most cases, of course, somewhere in the background, there's something holding the data, usually the database. And oftentimes people would be shy to place it in Kubernetes because it's not that great at, at handling storage for databases as first class entities. So there, it has replicated this uh, set and stuff like that, stateful sets. Uh, but if you try it, you, you know, it's sort of not, not enough. So you need something more. Uh, and for that, Portrox is there. I, I know I didn't answer the question entirely. I, I'm not sure what it, what it means. Uh, Another one. Uh, do the um, Portrox or Pure uh, have any uh, database specific features uh, help with database layer replication sharding ATC? Uh, I guess part of it you, you've uh, for sure seen already in the demo in the sense that uh, in this when I was creating the storage class, it would already have some uh, sort of profiles. Uh, one would be specific for DB. You can you can have different like IO uh, priorities. So these things are are tuned for different workloads. Uh, so for DB, you would you cho choose the one that I've chosen, and you can have different uh, different storages on the. Uh, on the machines. So for example, if you have a machine that has both SSDs and, and uh, standard spindles, you could have them in different pools with different capabilities. Uh, and for some workloads, you would use uh, those SSDs and for, for others, you would use uh, the spindles. So I would say this is a specific feature that, that is there to help uh, classifying workloads and in particular databases. For pure storage, uh, obviously the, those appliances have many, many features for for databases, but I'm not too familiar with those. Uh, so, yeah. 
that's another one. Andro, you mentioned cloud-based cloud hosting technologies do a great job at handling load balancing traffic. What makes them more desir desirable than scaling websites on your own server? Um, so I'll, I'll tell you my uh, point of view, uh, but it can be biased. So how I imagine a startup is that when it starts, uh, and now almost every company is called startup, right, when it starts, um, uh, you want to have something quickly. You don't want to buy hardware and start installing them, learning how to run Kubernetes on bare metal, which by the way is really complicated to do properly. You just want something that runs uh, and you, you just write a business code. Uh, anything else you run is slowing you down. Uh, anything else you write is slowing you down. At some point, uh, and, and for that clouds are uh, like cloud services, like AWS, GCP, others, um, th those are great to start with, right? Because they are sort of on the expensive side, sure, but everything is there. What you need is there and you can just start there. Eventually, you, you, you are successful if you're lucky. If not, uh, nobody cares, right? If you are successful, then you start sort of counting your expenses and uh, all of a sudden you see like you could save on, on moving at least partially on-prem and maybe use the public, uh, public cloud services to, uh, to just, uh, I don't know, like when, when you have a peak, uh, you you just spawn uh, hundreds of, of VMs there to, to cover for the peak, but the rest you you would cover in, in your data center or on your hardware. So I, I see it more like people will be moving in this direction when, when the company grows, uh, that, that they start seeing the extra expenses and now they can actually, because they are successful, they can actually afford to to move to some something like a hybrid cloud. And for that, it's important to have some uh, abstraction layers that we are not entirely locked in at that point. And I think that's it. So, uh, Lubos Pokorny is thanking you, uh, Ondra. I hope uh, okay. we answered uh, all uh, Salim uh, questions. If not, please uh, uh, write uh, Ondra directly. Uh, I will share the email in the comment section uh, after that or uh, in the, under the video. Uh, so, Thank you, Andro. And let me bring on the stage our second speaker, okay. Eric. Okay. Hi, Eric. Uh, hi, Terka. Hello, everyone. Wait, I will share my presentation as well. So, uh, Eric is a, a, a Revolgian. He's working with us uh, for a few months now. He has a huge experience uh, in a gaming industry, uh, especially from Mudfinger Games. Uh, probably you know them, uh, they're a well-known uh, game design studio uh, from Brno, right? Yeah. Uh, so, Eric, uh, stage is yours. I will just uh, put your... Um... Okay. Present, yeah. Yes, okay. okay. Okay, it's visible. Thank you, Terka, very much for your introduction. So, hello everyone again. My name is Rick Ferenc and I am part of Revolgy Gaming Initiative and I would like to talk with you a bit about uh, uh, like uh, gaming uh, backend architecture and I got one example on matchmaking service. Uh, I don't have any uh, code running because I, I don't think uh, it will be like uh, enough time to, to show everything but I want to tell you a story which I think is very important or very important to get an insight of the gaming studio and how the backend is working there. And the most problems we are coping with is that uh, game gaming at all is very like uh, fast moving environment. That means like uh, previously, uh, uh, before I stepped into the gaming, I worked uh, in uh, banking industry. And when someone told me like, we got a change and it will be in hurry, and that hurry means like three months. So you hear, Phew, I got three months. Now, when I step into the gaming, the same change, uh, it was maximum three days, you know? So you took a lot of coffee, you don't sleep like two nights and then, then it goes out into the production. So, and another problem with uh, the backend is that once you are working in the gaming studio, 
you want to do the games that means that you want to work on the like uh, unity engine or unreal engine and actually backend is like 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 that that common evil which no one wants to do it you know so then what happens most of the uh, like these studios got some solution which worked for them in let's say previous games and they just update it a bit and move it to another game and move it to another game yeah so uh where is my mouse here so let's continue and i will start with this one uh most of you probably know it yeah uh, so if you think good architecture is expensive dry bad architecture but uh yeah that's a common truth but also what i said is like uh once you got something which is which worked like uh in solutions before you try to use it and i got former colleague which said it's something like the hammer once you got a hammer in your head everything looks like a nail so you try to use hammer even on your like say, screen or your car or whatever and uh, then it comes to the problem yeah so uh let's start with uh, with this uh, matchmaking story and uh, uh it's uh something which i experienced it's a bit simplified and also it's a bit like overrated like in the problems it happens uh, and it didn't happen even on the matchmaking but also in other services and it's like common stuff which i which happened in my practice and which i heard from the friends and colleagues that happened on other studios as well so let's start a bit uh why i why I took uh, matchmaking because it's easy to easy example. You know, you you need a few people to get together and play the game. So uh, let's consider we are on the on the mobile platform, and you need from two to twelve players to get into the game. Yeah. So requirements are we need to connect two players to the duel, three players to the PvP. Uh, and 12 players to the that match yeah and uh, you need some kind of algorithm to pair them together that means like the the player with level one can't play with player with level 25 because that's like 30 seconds match and no one enjoy it yeah and as i said uh, we are considering the mobile platform that means you should connect in one minute so and how it's going into the into the new development you usually got like half a year so uh when we talk about like one month of development time it's 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 a huge huge time for for these studios uh which are developing for for the mobile game because they're every every minute count every day counts so but uh so first first blueprint for for this matchmaking is that uh it will mostly run on dedicated game servers. Uh, one one quote difference between what I when I'm talking about dedicated game servers, it's something like where the it's the first connection that will, must be the fastest server in the the game from UI. It will come to the server to this dedicated game server, and there runs some kind of blueprint of the let's say map you are running and this server is checking if you are not going through the for example through the walls or if you don't have like uh, in your magazine like 25 rounds and you you shoot 100 so that's the first uh, first like uh, check that should be the with the best latency faster servers and uh, then there are game backend servers that's something like microservices and services which store user data and do more of the persistency stuff and and like work behind so first blueprint is the matchmaking will be on the dedicated game server on the fastest because studio got the new deal with the provider that uh, we promise them lots of uh, concurrent users, which will give them a lot of money. So they said, OK, we got some kind of spare uh, compute engines for you, and you can run other services there as well, not only matchmaking, but also, for example, chat and stuff. So that's the deal. And on the backend, on that slower part of the cloud, 
you only store the persistent data, data for the service. Yeah. So we've got the uh, specific players. Uh, some of them plays from home. Some of them plays from, let's say, tram. So they don't have much time to connect. So you want to make it fast. Yeah. So that's that's the assumption how it should work. Or let's play. Uh, let's start it. So you as a backend developer. So back again, uh, I'm talking like you are working on this part. So not on dedicated game servers, you are not the, the playing with the engine, like Unreal Engine or Unity Engine, but you are really like doing microservices. So based on that blueprint, you got some info from the guys from game servers, and you you actually spend two days on the implementation that was easy. You are like, OK, nice one. I can do something else now. But of course, like as as the as the work on the game progress, guys on the game backend are like falling behind because they deal with other stuff on the on the game actually, and testers needs to test at least something. So your boss come to you and say, okay, something's changed. You have to help us with this uh, for testers and game developers we need to create like some kind of service which will mock the the game dedicated game server and we will have two players which will just connect and they can go through the map or dungeon and test it yeah so but that's not totally cloud you don't have to do it so you know something with uh, docker or with kubernetes so you you will put it into docker solution on some premises cloud at, uh, or, or your premises servers Put it there. Let let the let the testers play. Yeah. So that's again another two days. But we already spent four days like doing for testers, not 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 real stuff. Yeah. And what happened? Uh, we went a bit uh, to the beta testing. You got like one month till the real real game is going out, and at the beta test. You find out that the solution which was provided uh, with the in the dedicated game servers is slowing them down. So latency is big. People got experienced lots of lags, and that all of the functionality which is not related to the game and to to match actually has to go out. Yeah, that was wrong. Uh, the the assumption and you have to deal with new stuff. And your boss come to you and said, look. The solution already was there for for testers. It will be just just a few changes, and it will go up. But you actually didn't tell, told him that it's not on the cloud. So what you have to do now is uh, you have to change all the API to be to communicate with with game servers, create for them the rooms, uh, and send them back. You also have to take the ranking algorithms, which was implemented there and you have to implement your own on your cloud uh you have to do the special filtering so it's depending on the which region is the use, user or player uh, on which level he plays or experience and of course as it's as it comes because it's out of this this uh, contract from it should be cheap because already it's it costs you money more than it was counted before yeah so uh, here is the kind of uh, example that you will have three three functions like register player uh, to the match, unregister player for, for, from the match, and get rooms for the servers. Yeah, this is something uh, how look the, the register request. Yeah, you got like player ID in which region for which version of the game, what kind of uh, room you ask in which level is a user what kind of experience deal that to kill ratio to get the correct users to play against each other and this is how looks the get rooms uh, response like uh, to the servers so you will get some kind of for which region for which app and you got specific rooms yeah for cooperation for for that match for duel yeah okay so you said okay i want my bonuses i want to <laughs> to game work so i i really like forced myself and did my best and put it into the cloud as soon as possible 
test it with, with the users. And actually, before we went like to the production, we, we tested even we created some kind of like uh, uh, estimation how it should behave. And this solution is serverless. Uh, when I'm talking about serverless, I mean, for example, on Google Cloud, I mean App Engine and uh, Data Store as a, as a database. Or, for example, in uh, AWS, I mean uh, Elastic Beanstalk, Beanstalk and, and DynamoDB. So we got something like uh, you you pay there for uh, reads of the data, writes of the data, also the, the data transfer. Uh, you also pay for the CPU usage on how many instances of the servers you will create. And, and here I put like all around Zoom, just for comparison, you will see in, in the future slide that, that this will be like useful. And uh, the based on the, the prediction that how successful the game should be, you got like uh, it should be 3,600,000 players per month there in your matchmaking like uh, going through it, yeah? So that's the expectations. So as I said, you did your best in 14 days, you did it, but overall you got 18 days of the of the, of the the work only on this, this microservice, let's say, yeah? So game is going into the production. First month is always like hectic, so for you, you, you are taking care of everything, logs, stuff like uh, checking instances, also small corrections. Uh, so this is how, how actually you feel all the time, one month. This is how your boss see it. And uh, when your friends and family ask you, like, why can't you come home? <laughs> what are you doing? That's, that's something like this. So, so, and after this one month, when you, did this firefighting with with all the all the stuff you don't 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 like predict before and you have to change you have a time to check like how the the matchmaking was was doing so and what's the reality and this this is the prediction which we were seeing before and this is actually reality and as you can see the the amount is a bit higher so you didn't catch it, right? And also what happened is like, you don't even get close to, to the 3 million players. So something is wrong, definitely. The game is not performing as you as it should, and also the matchmaking service not not performing as it should. So uh, another info, like when we, when we check uh, like how the users behave in specific region, let's say we are in the US region, this is the, the, the morning, like, and the going to the, like, through the, through the day, the more people will join, like, this is the, usually the evening stuff. And then during the night and stuff, it, it going down. And it's mostly is like a nice sinusoid. So we, you can like, go and see that like users it's it's usual pattern in in this in these cases but when you took a look on your logs and and and, and some kind of analytics you you see actually it looks like this and not like this and it's kind of strange yeah this is how it you predict it should be like this but actually it's it's like this and guys, this is actually the chart of the heart rate of your boss from, from 50 to 200 when you're telling him you've got no idea what's happening. So, so actually this is the, when you hit the wall. <laughs> so game dev is not threatful at all, like Blake, 26 year old. So this is, this is what happened because now it's a panic time. You know, you find out you, you don't have enough players and you don't know what is happening. So what will happen, you really have to sit with analytics guy, go through your code, go through your stuff and find out what's going on. Yeah. So you spend the whole one day just analyzing what's happening. And we got some stuff uh, which, which we find out. And there is that we didn't count in the test that in every region there will be multiple game servers and multiple hubs that means that not only 
one server is asking for the rooms, but there is a multiple. And also what we find out that there is not enough players in the queues lines. So we, we predicted there will be more people asking for the match, but actually it is not. And uh, the another technique, when we saw that, that chart which was going up and down, that means that people were canceling their request. So they didn't uh, wait a whole minute to just get into the, into the game. And they, 20 seconds, then cancel the request and then join again. But that, that, that made the problem with the algorithm. So solutions are like introduce the caching. That means for the servers, which ask for the same at the same time for the same, same like room. So cache the, the info and don't read it again from the database to make it faster and more effective. So introduce the ranking function with time boundaries. That means like when the user already wait 20 seconds, it widen the range of the people he can play. So depending on the time, it will it will connect him with more people. So that means that even the sm smaller queue will, will help them to get into the match like faster. And do the specific stuff when the user is canceling the, the registration at the time when the room is sent to the to the dedicated game service. That means that play is starting, but you unregister. That means that 12 people should play, but you you it's not six against six, but it's three against four. And that, that should not happen. So and dedicated game service should ask more. Uh, more often than, than it was before. It was 10 seconds, now it will be five, yeah? So that's the solution. Again, you know what you are doing. You spend another four days overall on this service 23. Let's have a look what happened. So as you can see, this is the, the latest solution. This is the solution before. This is the prediction. So. It's kind of better, you know, we get the cost from 370 to 329, but still it's not even to the prediction and still it was not enough with the players in the queues. That means that we help a little bit, but it's, 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 it's not, not, not what we expect. Again, you have to go to the analytics guy and now he provides you with this stuff. This is like, whoa. So you got no chance to, to find out alone. So we have to sit with him, explain him what the matchmaking is doing. You have to explain him what you expect and what are you looking into the data. And he should help you with, with solving this, these charts and what does it mean? Yeah. So again, no implementing nothing, just two days, just searching what what is wrong and what is not wrong yeah and what we come from is that actually we got enough players in the game but they are not so interested in the in the playing the match because it takes a long time so we are coming from a new stuff for the matchmaking and it's invitation that's mean when the player comes into the game and just fooling around on doing anything he will get the invitation for for the room which will which is almost created that means when for you need 12 people for the room and you got there 10 people we will send invitation for let's say 20 people and two of them join they they actually in in instance go to the to the match so we will create some kind of demand but with this comes another like challenges and you have to you have to like, for example, unregister the player from this invitation. So when he's uh, waiting for some uh, one kind of match, he should not get invited to the another type of match, of course. And may, you have to make the system uh, not irritatable for the players. That means one they don't care about an invitation. You show them like two or three times, and for time, it's not there because it's waste of time, and also it's not 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 good for the players. And of course, you want to create the demand. So 
once the user missed the invitation, it will show him something on the on the screen like uh, new match is going on without you. You missed it. Yeah. So okay, that's the like requirement. So you again need new API because you have uh, you need some kind of new stuff there. Uh, new algorithms for for picking this player for the invitations. You have to also store all the matches where the user will be invited. Uh, this new info about the to the players that were too slow and tell him like, come on, you miss it. And again, because we want to invite as much people as possible, we need to get more info about these rooms and more info about this invitation. That means we are moving the this get room request to get every second to the to the game server yeah so again lots of stuff lots of programming and like you are really focused on it you will handle it in seven days to to do it to to test it and to get to the production so overall it's 32 days but again you you achieve it but of what I want to like show you now is this this first one that was the get room response to the game servers when it was created as the first one. Yeah. But now it's look a bit like this, where you got not only rooms, but you got also these types of invitation, you got these cancellations. And this is of course uh, a bit simplified stuff. The the real response will be like 10 times bigger than this one. Uh, when we counting, you got like 5,000 uh, common players in, 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 this, in this one one time period. So you have to handle 5,000 players like every second in the, in the stuff because you are sending them invitation, you are registering them. So, so the response is several times big. But you put it onto the production, you are the hero of the neighborhood going to with the guys on the pier like everything is okay you return home and again you hit the wall at 3 a.m at the morning your boss is calling you like come on something's happened we are not able to to join to the game no one is getting to the match something's happened with the matchmaking service and we are like 3 a.m really so let me have a look yeah and what do you find out is that you reached the daily quota for cost on matchmaking service which was set there like three months ago uh because the service was really simple you of course forget about it and you put there lots of new stuff but the quota stay the same so what what happened you did your own ddos from dedicated game servers to your matchmaking service because they were hitting it so hard with lots of traffic and of course what happened now is that even with that stuff you implemented there it is most expensive microservice in the game backend which is it should have been the the less expensive or the the really minimum and you you got to to the the really big numbers now uh where is my mouse here it is so so <laughs> what really happened so are we happy it's it's working now you got uh, tons of players there but they can connect into the game yeah <laughs> and uh, as you can see the overall monthly cost is 2261 dollars which is like compared with the previous one like really bad you know so you have to really like think fast and work fast to to make it work again correctly so uh and this is what i was talking about this this hammer once you got your hammer in the hand everything is like nail and this is how you actually misused the serverless and database read and write to the maximum extent and now you know you can't go further with it. So what do you have to do? You have to really create some kind of uh, cache database on, let's say, Redis. 
and you have to cache everything. You have to cache registration to the match. You have to cache registration to the invitation, and you have to cache all the responses which are like common for the dedicated game server. So what will suddenly happen? The the place where you were comfortable with like this serverless stuff, and you are just deploying your your command code. You have to suddenly. Uh, implement in the Redis. Okay, you got some kind of cloud solution like serverless Redis, but anyway, you have to set some stuff. Yeah. And uh, of course, what you were able to do in, let's say, SQL database or no SQL database, it's it's hard in caching stuff because there's key value pairs and the filtering and most of the like picking their stuff, it's, it's harder, of course. And that means you have to rework most of the code you you have written because these reading uh, Redis algorithms for for uh, picking the players will be totally totally different. So again, but you are dedicated. You want to make it work. So four days, thirty six days overall. That's already super too much for one one service. Yeah, but but you made it actually. So. What happened is first time in history <laughs> on the production, it, it got under the prediction. Everything works as it should. And uh, you are happy. But the cost of it was that uh, one month, it, it was the, the most expensive stuff. And you spent like 30, 30 more days on it than it was predicted before. Yeah. And. Uh, Anyway, when it works, what, what are the drawbacks is that actually that filtering is limit, limit, limited. That means that uh, once it is hard to, to make a contract with uh, game designers to make it like more generic or more scalable. So you got some kind of specific rules for this uh, matching people together. And for Redis, it's it's hard to do it, or you have to specifically implement it, hard code it. So we support only limited filtering criteria. Uh, also, in the cache, everything is going like not persistent. So you have to either create your own logs there or go blind. Mostly, when in these cases, when you don't have a time, you are mostly blind. So we are just putting some stuff in somewhere, and also. Once the Redis uh, fall down for some reason, it's not not common, but sometimes it happened. You have to have at least, at least last state of the request to not not lose the stuff. So you you are not able to lose lose registered users. You are maybe able to lose rooms. Yeah. So back to what we are doing in this game initiative is like we already got some kind of experience and some kind of uh, info about how the studio works and we provide uh, like maybe better solution or not better but uh, but something which we know it will work and you don't have to go through this ordeal which I was talking about so we provide some kind of uh, uh, solutions on server res redis uh, on how to which data to persist which data to not persist also like to communicate with the uh, messaging system and SKU, this publish subscribe with the uh, dedicated game servers and not through the requests, which can really create this denial of service. And of course, what we are like uh, uh, already know from the from our experience is that it is better to have uh, game backend servers on your own cloud solutions and not not provided from some other third parties because they are not in the same same uh, area and yeah that's that's causing some some kind of problem and more costs so i got a uh, small architecture like example like how we think this uh, game matchmaking service should look like so you should have those dedicated game servers in your own cloud you should have some kind of serverless or kubernetes uh, like uh, master matchmaker which stores data of the request to the to the persistent database, but also put them into the Redis. And based on how much people is requesting uh, the service, 
it will only call cloud function or lambda which will base on on these requirements from this master take the specific users put them into the messaging queue so this uh, public subscribe and and dedicated game server will get noticed so it's uh, then very fast generic solution very cheap and uh, it will definitely work on most of the most of the games that that i at least know okay so back back to the what we do so we are a bunch of uh, like uh, game backend professionals uh, which are orienting on helping people with uh, game server security of course analytics uh, bit of artificial intelligence for bots for example kubernetes and serverless uh, so we helping uh, game studios not only create new backends but also move the the old uh, backends to the kubernetes or serverless so it, it will be more effective and of course we are trying to to do as much with security and architecture and cost analytics for you uh i got more experience most experience on on google cloud but also aws so that's where we put our proven solution and what 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 is the the main stuff is these quick starts uh, or landing zones we call it so we got some kind of pre-created solutions uh, which we can run and put it into your your demand so depending on what what type of game you are creating we we are able to to change this solution solution to to your stuff so we we know how to do it on google cloud on aws maybe also on uh microsoft azure but that's that's a bit bit out of out of my scope okay i think that's all I wanted to tell you. Hope hope it, it brings some some value to you. And now I think it's time for Q and A. Thank you, Eric. It was great. Uh, we have a lot of questions. Oh. Mm, yes. Uh, so, how do the game uh, developers handle all the traffic for multiplayer? Uh, oh, look, it's a. Uh, as I said, uh, you got these uh, dedicated game servers. That's that's the like first first place to to hit. So most of the most of the stuff from the UI that means from your game. For example, once you got it into in your in your mobile phone, it goes to this dedicated game server. Depending on what kind of play, play uh, game it is, uh, it's either uh, like PvP, which is very like uh, live and have to be very responsive. That one, for example, don't go through any special firewalls or something like that. The the, the all the stuff security is implemented in in game dedicated server. But when you got something like when you take turns like card games or something like that, that could be more secure and going through specific traffic and don't even need this dedicated game server. So, and how we handle it, either you got serverless or you got a specific Kubernetes uh, stuff uh, and you have to know how to scale it. The good stuff on the dedicated game servers is as the, it is stateless mostly. So that means it's easy to scalable and also we got some kind of rules like uh, when we know for example based on the our experience and and how the game behave how many co concurrent players one server will handle for example let's say we got one server which will handle 2000 concurrent players so we got some kind of uh, info there about it and once it hits uh, 1800 we will start another server in the same region for for new players yeah so i i hope that that's that's what what they ask another one what are a pros and cons in using serverless to uh, uh, manage games server hosting multiplayer uh i'm big big uh, promoter of serverless so for me it is that uh, actually you have to only write the code with specific sdk and everything else is done for you that means you will write one script which is your ci cd pipeline which will deploy your code into the gcp or aws 
and everything other is take care about so it means uh, like security it means like scaling it means like connection to the database it means like scaling of the database and stuff so uh the real advantage is that that for example what team like say five people team for for non-serverless let's say kubernetes manual kubernetes or virtual machine will handle then one developer with serverless is able to do in the same time so that's that's exactly the the advantage what i see there um what is the best way to prevent ddos on the game servers mm -hmm. this is hard uh actually you have to count a bit with this uh but there are some kind of specific security checks so you know for example like uh, you got uh, patterns in the traffic and you got it from specific region mostly and you know that at this time there is usually like i don't know 10,000 requests per second and suddenly when it comes from 10,000 to double or triple that there is something wrong with it and you starting to check uh, the requests which are coming from the same sources faster than usual so this is this is one prevention that's kind of automatic and second is like uh, in your game uh, it should not uh, or everything should be like secured even the communication so it should not show where the servers are so common practice is also you got some kind of like middle check which we which is like some kind of server which is known to everyone but this server is sending real data back to the game servers so hackers are not able to to not to find it but find it so fast yeah i that's that's all i can say <laughs> i would say so hope i i i answered the the question rightly Mm -hmm. and i think terka is out yes uh, i'm back yeah. sorry yeah you're <laughs> back okay so i finished the question actually so you you can come up with another one yes sorry my internet dropped um so there is a, another question um are there out of the box cloud matchmaking services uh yes they are uh i think aws uh, lambiard uh, solution got their own uh matchmaking service also there is uh there is uh, some kind of uh, like open source solutions like uh, open match i think uh google cloud he, is promoting this stuff so they are uh i don't see any disadvantage of those uh you just have to consider if it's either there are or disadvantages maybe you get vendor locked because these are provided services of course and it's sometimes it's better to see inside it's it should not be a totally black box because as I, I mentioned in my example in the presentation it's good to know from the analytics what is happening inside because some things you can't predict yeah so mm, I recommend if you got like out of the box solution to to know what's what's inside and how it how it works yeah but uh, definitely it it can work for any any game uh, is there any standard tech stack used for backends in the video game uh, industry what about the used languages is the c++ still still the go to language or not mm -hmm. standards uh, uh in in gaming industry nothing is standard like uh, <laughs> uh, of course uh, like uh, lots of these engines like for example which are created in the studio not not common one like you know the unity or uh, unreal engine those are written mostly in c++ because that's the fastest 
uh, language there for for this graphic stuff so they are and of course most of them are really old and most of them like work in c plus plus but i don't think it's standard because for example unity now works also under c sharp unreal engine also supports c plus plus and c sharp uh so um, i wouldn't say it's like standard but uh, what i would recommend is when you want to to be a game developer like focus really on on unity on unreal engine those are i think two most common engines and uh, you can learn a lot they they also support a lot of like uh exercises like how to learn not not even the with the graphics but also with ai and also with this matchmaking stuff or other services like leaderboards uh they they support a lot of lots of nice stuff for the gaming so i can recommend uh, unity and Un unreal engine yeah. oh terka you are mute Yes, it happens sometimes. Okay. <laughs> Are dedicated game servers more a CPU bound or more a AO bound? Mm -hmm. Input output bound. Yeah, mm, it depends again uh, on your game. Like uh, for example, when you uh, got like really really uh, mm, complex map. For for example, when when we take a first person shooter. It will be more CPU bound because you got lots of computation. What is happening in the game? How many players you got there? And uh, anyway, then the input output is really small. But back to the like uh, these turn games when you got like card games or something which is not not so hitting hard uh, the the engine or like this this spatial stuff that like, you don't have to know if something is going through the ball or not then it's more input output because that's that's most the stuff which will which will go there so it depends on the kind of the game and also on the complexity of the of the like uh, like uh overall sphere where the game is happening like environment sorry i couldn't get to the environment yeah uh, are there any particular algorithms, approaches, or concerns that need to be addressed uh, that are common in video games backend, but not usually encountered elsewhere? Mm. <sighs> not, not really. When, mm, when I when I speak about like backend, I mean these microservices behind. So uh, usually you you want to make them like. Uh, with great API, so it's easy to use. You want to make them fast and you want to make them cheap. So from that point of view, the game backend is like like any other backend with lots of uh, game services. Those are like, or microservices, those are like small, but have to be fast, you know, and have to be easy to use because as I said, in game one week, it works like this and you find out it doesn't work for players and you have to change it and best way to change it it already got like good this base in the back end with good api which you don't have to change much or, or is easy to change and then then you can create good stuff but uh, not special algorithms when when we talk about like game real like what's happening on game backend and on the on the client there you got uh, ai algorithms for using these bots for example when you want to play you you don't have enough players but let's say you need 12 players you got only 10 and two players are bots which will play with you then it's special algorithms which will train them but uh, that's that's behind the scope of of this like usual backend so yeah this ai learning stuff it's 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 like special and i think this is it uh i don't see any other question uh do you have a guys uh question uh like between you <laughs> No. <laughs> Thank you. It was really nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's also that. 
Thank you for the time. So thank you very much. Uh, this is it. We are on the finish line uh, tonight. Thank you all for joining us tonight, especially to our speakers. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you on board. Uh, thank you, Revolgy uh, and the whole team of Revolgy uh, to bring this meetup live and uh, powering this uh, kind of events. For those who are uh, thinking about new adventures, we are constantly hiring because we are uh, like we in Revolgy, we are rapidly uh, growing. So have a look on our website. Uh, follow us on Twitter, ping us message. Uh, we are also in GitHub and uh, we can do uh, coffee, at least the virtual, virtual one. And maybe in the summer, we will do some kind of uh, cloud and uh, beer or cloud native beer meetup or a barbecue party or, or something like that. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, stay safe stay negative and see you next time <laughs> okay thank you very much have a nice day guys Bye. <laughs>